Dear friends and fans of Glen Gold, today is with us a very special guest, Mr. Kevin Doyle, sound engineer of Glen Gold and winner of the Grammy and Juno Award. Kevin has a prolific activity as a sound engineer with great artists, including Andrea Bocelli, Yo Yo Ma, Van Morrison, Shane De Connor, The Keys, and many others. A warm welcome to Kevin Doyle. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Alita. Glad to meet you. <laughs> Thank you, me too. So, um, first of all, how are you? How did you get through uh, this lockdown period? In Canada, it is, has not been very bad. It, it, we have, we have uh, had some fatalities with older people, but you may not know Canada is very advanced with medical situations. And uh, we have very excellent health care in Canada, provided by the government. So we are very fortunate as Canadians to benefit from excellent health care. I'm very, I'm very happy to, to hear that. Um, I'm also so excited and I don't know which question to start with. Uh, you have worked a lot with Glen Gold and especially during uh, the last years of his career and his life. And surely the first thing that come up into my mind is to ask you how and I mean, when you, you met Glen. I would go back to maybe 19, late 1979. As you may know, Glenn would do a lot of his work at the CBC in Toronto, but the CBC was on strike for a while and Glenn needed to finish a project. So he had to look for an outside studio. So he came to a studio in Toronto and asked if he could get an engineer. We had three engineers at the time, but none of them could read music. I was an assistant to the engineers because I was very young at the time and informed Glenn that I could read music like I could read English. <laughs> and then we had a good relationship starting right there at the studio. I did not know much of Glenn Gould before then, but I knew my father and Glenn's father, Herbert Gould, had offices side by side in an office building in Toronto. Wow. So my father knew Glenn's father, Herbert Gould, but that was a coincidence. Yeah, such a particular coincidence. And also Glenn uh, was known for his good humor and he loved to make some pranks and jokes to his friend. And maybe you're, you were the subject of one of his pranks, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> no um, Glenn had a format of working with engineers with mixing, with volume changes. And he would ask the engineer, he would indicate with a finger gesture either to move the level up or down. Yes. And this is a very long and tedious process to work. <laughs> so when I met Glenn, I told him I could read music very easily and he did not have to indicate to me where he needed changes in volume. All he had to do was write on the score and I would do them. Glenn had never worked like this before and we attempted it and it worked very, very well. And Glenn was very, very happy. He was so happy that he decided that I would be his engineer from now on, even though I was very young. But, um, and, uh, sorry. <laughs> what, would normally, what would normally take about four hours with another engineer now only took one engineer with working with me. 
just based on the fact that I could follow the music score and make the changes he requested. Um, one of, I mean, one of the question is, one of the question is, how um, was Glenn during the job, you say, he was, I mean, friendly uh, from uh, the biographies, especially in the book by Kevin Bazzana, our friend, uh, you have often mentioned uh, about the famous recordings of Wagner's Sieg Siegfried Ideal uh, with um, 13 members of the uh, Toronto Symphony Orchestra and Glenn as a conductor. Uh, would you like to tell us about the experience inside the job? Yes, Glenn, in early 1982, had made a decision that he would no longer record any more piano music. His future, he wanted to work as a conductor with his own interpretations of musical pieces. And one piece that we tried early 1932, uh, 1982, with a Beethoven Piano Concerto in which he invited a pianist up from Juilliard School of Music to play the piano. But due to circumstances with the orchestra at that time, it did not prove to be a good experience. The next decision was made in the late spring that he would revisit one of his piano transcriptions of the Siegfried Idol by Wagner. And his attempt to do an orchestral version approximately at the same tempo as the piano transcription. And he asked his dear friend, Victor Del Bello, to assemble 13 good musicians for the recording. And this made a difference for Glenn was given a list of very excellent musicians and top performers who would respect him as a conductor and do their best to perform for him. And thus began the idea of recording the Siegfried Idol, the orchestral version with Glenn conducting. The original recording, I believe, was in July of 1982. And unknown to the musician, most musicians, as you may know, Alita, when recording, record the entire piece oh. of music. Wow. And, and maybe repeat the recording a couple of more times. Okay. Glenn informed the musicians that this was not his idea of recording. He was going to go through the score chronologically in bits and pieces until he approved the sections and moved on to the newer sections. So we would start with the beginning, three or four minutes, and he would inform the musicians that we would only be recording three or four minutes. And the musicians weren't performing like this and had no idea how it would ever result in a final production. But obviously anybody who's known Glenn with his piano recordings know this is was his chosen methodology of working, to record in sections and to edit later. Absolutely. It's, it's incredible. So, it's incredible. It, it's like he worked uh, in a film editing kind of. Exactly. This is how we did it. Very, very clever. Um, it's amazing to listen to you. <laughs> One of the most appreciated records in the world, uh, uh, and which is certainly a pillar of classical music and, of course, a reference for all pianists, uh, is the disc of Bach Goldberg Variations by Glenn and recorded in 1981-1982, uh, with which you won a Grammy Award Sound Engineer. Congratulations, of course. I also add the good fortune and the chance to be able to play the CF2 piano at the right time to know in 2018 
2018. And I must tell you um, that it was a great emotion, of course, first of all, but it, it was incredible to touch it and, and incredible the good sound that this piano produced so clear, so pure. And what was like recordings, this monumental uh, pillar in, in the musical literature with, with this piano and with this amazing art that we love so much? Um, Glenn and I met to talk about various recordings on how to record them with the process that would make the emotional interpretation the number one priority. And this would call for different micing, microphone techniques on the piano or and or the orchestra. For example, in a cello concerto, in a concert hall, if you sit too close, you would hear the cello with no re reverberation coming from the music hall. Mm -hmm. And the cello would sound two dimensional. And you would not hear the rest of the orchestra in proper balance. If you sit at the very back of the concert hall, there is a big problem with volume and emotion. In the very back of the recording hall, the cello would sound too distant. And also, when the cello would be playing ensemble with the orchestra, you would not be able to hear the cello at all. Due to the fact you have one cello competing in volume with an entire orchestra. So Glenn and I, I, I informed Glenn that if we use different microphones at different distances, we can create a much more emotional appeal to the recording process and to the final product. In other words, we, we, type, we almost revolutionized classical recording in the early 80s. Absolutely. In the Siegfried Idol, that in the orchestra version, that technique was used throughout the recording. At the end of the recording, Glenn took a while to appreciate it, but he loved it in the end. As he said, this recording is like wearing your heart on the sleeve. <laughs> Amazing. Glenn was very, very impressed with this new form of recording and looked to a great feature with it wow. where he can control the dimensional sounds of the orchestra as it would relate to the emotional expression of the orchestra do you understand alita yes uh, it's, I'm, I'm impressed and uh, of course also one of the questions that come in my mind is about how did you guys manage the famous humming and the chair <laughs> how did you did you get to this trouble <laughs> I, I i i i did not do a lot of piano recording with glenn okay but i'm telling you from what i learned from working with glenn with the humming and when glenn would start playing a piano piece he would be very aware of his hands moving and the execution of his plan. That would not last very long, for maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute at the most. And he would switch from the performer to the listener and become totally oblivious of playing the piano part. So in effect, he became the performer to the listener. And as a listener, he was enjoying the music so much that he would hum along, or as would be today, sing along. <laughs> so he would hum along a harmony part, or his singing, what he thought a, a melodic idea was. So you would have to look at it at a different, more of an emotional viewpoint that Glenn would transition from the performer to a listener caught up in the emotion of the music which is amazing because especially in the Goldberg 
the technicality of the pieces, it's amazing that you're looking, when you watch Glenn play, you are watching a man so taken emotionally by the music, and it just happens to be a coincidence that he is also a performer. I have worked with hundreds of musicians in my life, and very few musicians get to that level where they can easily transition from the performer to admiring listener. I talked to Yo-Yo Ma much later in the 90s about this process and he was in total agreement where he finds that he gets so taken emotionally with the music that he starts to hum alone. And as I said, very few musicians have the technical capability or the emotional appeal to reach that level. Okay, uh, Alita, did you understand what I was saying? Abs absolutely, absolutely. I understand perfectly. And of course, it's very fascinating to uh, listen to uh, this connection between an artist, uh, Glenn Gold Prize, of course, uh, as Yo-Yo Ma, uh, telling this incredible uh, feeling he has with music, so the humming and the process of creation, as Glenn wants to surpass uh, the instrument itself you want to sing you want to complete the music um, of course I want to enter more in the uh, private uh, um, sphere asked you about a very private question uh, Glenn Gold left us at the age of 50 very uh, prematurely and I would love to ask you where, uh, where where were you when you heard the sad news I was, I lived very close to the studio where I worked and I had known it was, I think it was a Tuesday the week before when I went to go work with Glenn, there was no answer at the studio door, which was unlike Glenn. And I phoned and there was no answer. So the next day I talked to his assistant, Ray. Roberts, who informed me that Glenn had had a stroke the night before and had to go to the hospital. And then I got a phone call from Ray Roberts on the weekend saying that the situation did not look very good for Glenn's survival. On Monday when I finished work, I was taking the transport home and I could see the front page of the local newspapers with an express edition and Glenn's picture was on the front page of all the major newspapers in Toronto announcing his death, that he had died Monday, October 4th, I believe around 11 a.m. And that is when I initially found out. And then when I got home, I talked to Ray Robert to inform me exactly what happened. And I believe the funeral was a couple of days later that week. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's, uh, it was a big loss, not only as, um, of course, a human level, as you met him personally, but for the humanity. It was a big loss because we think Glenn Gould is a truly an inspiration and of course another question is about uh, um, your recordings with great artists uh, such as Bocelli, such as Yo-Yo Ma uh, you just told about uh, is uh, uh, inspiring uh, Glenn Gold's voice but uh, putting an imaginary composition um, what were the recordings needs of Glenn Gold compared to the artist like uh, Bocelli, Yo-Yo Ma uh, we know that um, he was a perfectionist as you said but we would like to know what he asked to you and the collaborators um, because his technique of sound engineer, of, of sound um, engineering, were very uh, futuristic for the 60s, for example, or for the 80s. Well, Glenn, all of Glenn's recordings were edited and mostly done in, in analog technology. And then 1990, the world switched, recording world switched from analog 
to digital editing and recording and mixing. Mind you, the gold brick was recorded digitally, but all the editing had to be approved with analog tape editing, which then would be edited digitally. So I think Glenn would have loved the new technology of these days, a master at it. In a, in a certain unique way, Glenn was a, a futuristic. Um, he, he basically drove the need for where recording is today. With certainly with editing, with audio recording, editing, and mixing. It is, it is sad that he did not live to see this revolution in sound. Yeah, it's, it's really inspiring even today because his street was so uh, personal, uh, typical, recognizable. Because when you listen to Glen Gold, you're assured that the pianist is Glen Gold. And it's so remarkable and uh, it's like a trademark, I can say. And you, as a sound engineer, did an amazing job to give us. Uh, this freshness and vitality, because when we listen to Glen Gold, uh, we have the impression that every time we reproduce the tape, the CD, or a video, uh, that he play in front of us is like uh, uh, to listen to a friend play the piano. Exactly. Yes. Very much so. Uh, one last question. Um, you happen, of course, to talk with Glenn, and I suppose as well about work, also about life. Um, there's something that uh, impressed you, there's something that uh, he left uh, in your memory, and something um, if you like to, to uh, share with us. I would say overall, I think uh, Glenn had a, a great sense of humor. He loved to laugh. He was a great humanitarian. He carried a, he very much cared about the less fortunate in society. And he loved animals. He left part of his estate to the unfortunate and to the care of animals. He was very much an, a thoughtful man. When my first son was born, Glenn, one, Glenn was the first one to send flowers to my wife at the hospital. How sweet. So, and uh, I would say of all artists I have ever worked with, and I've worked with very, very many, Glenn is the most consummate artist I've ever worked for. He truly, his number one priority was in making music. He yeah. was not impressed with wealth or with possessing so many, you know, nice cars and nice homes. He had an average looking apartment in Toronto. He drove an average car. Nothing impressed Glenn more than his love for music. That's, so, that's... which is very different from today's world. That's so moving. That's incredible, uh, Kevin. I would love to thank you so much uh, for this great interview. And uh, I hope to have you soon as a guest again on our little page of documentary on Glen Gold. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yes, and if you want to say something to our audience, I just wanted to say, stay healthy and take care. And I miss Italy. Oh, thank you very much again. A big hug from Italy, dear Kevin, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Alberto.